Hello, everyone. My name is Gael Mohel, and I'm the Exhibitions Curator at the Image Center. On behalf of the IMC, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight for Curators in Conversation, Ward 81. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from Toronto Metropolitan University, which is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university has recently acknowledged its role in the history of Canada's residential school system and changed the institution's name to redress that legacy in furtherance of truth and reconciliation. We embrace our shared ongoing responsibility for this land where our institution stands. I'd also like to mention a few program notes before we begin. We are recording tonight's talk and we'll be uploading it onto our YouTube channel in the near future for those who aren't able to attend tonight or for those who would like to watch again. After the presentation tonight, we will have a Q&A session where we will be addressing questions from our virtual audience. If you have anything you'd like to ask during the lecture, please use the Q&A function located uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit your question. And lastly, in the case of a technical difficulty, we thank you for remaining patient with us while we correct the issue. Currently on view uh, in the Image Center's main gallery is an exhibition titled Mary Ellen Mark, Ward 81, which was co-curated by Caitlin Bohr and myself. Caitlin is with us tonight. Um, hello. Caitlin is currently the New Hall Curatorial Fellow at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And as of today, she holds a PhD from Rutgers University. Congratulations, Caitlin, what a great day and achievement. In 1976, American photographer Mary Ellen Mark spent 36 days living in the Oregon State Hospital with licensed therapist and writer Karen Folger Jacobs to photograph the patients of Ward 81, a high security locked psychiatric facility for women. Mark's unique access led to a nuance and compelling portrayal of female mental health patients. This exhibition brings together the resulting photographs audio recordings and archival materials to offer an in-depth view of the artist's experimental and groundbreaking approach to documentary style photography. The exhibition is organized in collaboration with Falkland Road, the Mary Ellen Mark Foundation in New York. Thank you to Meredith Liu, Julia Bessin, Martin Bell, and Evan Carter. The show is on view until April 1st and is accompanied by a book Ward 81 Voices, published by Stado Verlag. The publication is available for purchase at the IMC. The presentation tonight will be structured in three parts. Caitlin will first provide some historical background and context on the relationship between photography and mental health. I will then present the Ward 81 Project's ambitions before we finish by giving a virtual tour of the exhibition discussing some of our curatorial decisions. Caitlin, we're so happy you were able to join us tonight. Uh, over to you for the first part of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gael. It's great to be here. And thank you to our, all of our collaborators um, on this amazing project. It's really been an honor to be involved in this. Um, so for many reasons I'll detail in tonight's program, Mary Ellen Mark and Karen Folger Jacobs project Ward 81 was without precedent. The two women lived in an adjacent ward of Oregon State's only locked psychiatric board for women and recorded the experiences of the women who lived there. And patients who in Ward 81 had been court mandated to be there because doctors had testified that they were a danger to themselves or others. But Mark and Jacobs avoided knowing specific case histories, choosing instead to know each woman on their own terms. And despite this, whenever I look at Mark's photographs from Ward 81, I'm consistently reminded of earlier examples of psychiatric photography. And so tonight I'm going to place Ward 81 within a longer continuum of photographing mental health, in part to demonstrate just how radical this book was. If I can have the next slide. And the next one. 
Psychiatric patients have been a subject for photography since the 1850s, just a few years after the medium was invented. And there exists a particularly deep history of male uh, photographers depicting female patients. On at least one occasion during their stay at Ward 81, Mark and Jacob staged a formal photo shoot of women, photographing them before a makeshift backdrop, dressed in various costumes. And Mark later said that during this shoot, Susie told her that this is what it was like to be crazy. This is how a, a person who was institutionalized should look. On the next slide. She may have been thinking of one of the earliest examples of psychiatric photography. Dr. Hugh Welsh Diamond, a British physician at the Surrey County Lunatic Asylum, um, who was an acquaintance of one of the medium's inventors and began using photography to portray psychiatric patients. He was one of the first doctors to use photography in a scientific capacity, and he believed photography could be used as a form of record keeping, but also potentially as a therapy, showing patients photographs of themselves in order to reveal differences between states of wellness and illness. Next photograph. Photographs of Mona, one of Mark's most expressive and dramatic conspirators, um, at times displayed scenes of real emotional distress in photographs. Next slide. It's difficult to look at her photographs and not think of one of the most well-known examples of psychiatric photography. The French neurologist Jean Martin Charcot's photographs of women suffering from the controversial and now discredited condition of hysteria. No longer accepted as a legitimate disorder, this, this syndrome kind of encodes the historical roots of mental illness within misogyny, as the term derives from the Greek word for uterus. But for over three decades at the Salpetriere, and with a firm belief in photography's value to the hospital, Charcot employed different photographers, including Albert Wand, to document his photographs, at her, his patients at the hospital, and seeking to visualize manifestations of hysteria in patients, particularly including facial features, gestures, actions, um, and scenes that borderline on scenes of religious mania and often have kind of sexualized overtones. Next slide. Images of patients lying in bed by Mary Ellen Mark, often catatonic and follow, possibly following various treatments. Um, similarly, recall other, other images um, made by Charcot. Next image. This photograph of a woman suffering from some form of epilepsy possibly was published in a medical journal in 1871 and describes how this woman, despite having a history of trauma and illness, was believed to be suffering from hysteria because uh, her like symptoms were relieved by um, putting pressure on her lower abdomen, um, and you know the the, the like interest in photography and photographing her was primarily to um, show how her she was unable to um, release her her fist from being clenched. Next slide. For Mark and Jacobs. Photographing electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, which was then often referred to as electroshock therapy, um, was, an, was a crucial part of Ward 81, um, but it was uncertain if they would be able to get permission to make the photograph public. Um, but in their taped conversations about the project, they repeatedly discussed the importance of capturing the image um, because they knew it was an essential and fascinating um, aspect of unseen life at an institution. And Mark had a very clear idea of what kind of image she wanted for this to, to represent ECT. And it was a close up image with the apparatus and nurse's hands on a patient as shock was administered. Next slide. Mark may have been thinking of another Saul Petriere project from the 1860s, which was um, Guillaume Benjamin um, Duchenne de Boulogne's extensive publication called The Mechanism of Human Expression, Studies in Emotion and Social Interaction, which was published in France in 1862. And these images saw Duchenne using weak electrical currents and a metal apparatus to stimulate different contractions of, fa of facial muscles in order to make like a catalog of human emotion. And so like this, like Mary Ellen's project, um, which took place in a psychiatric hospital, this too was about human emotion, but it takes on very theatrical elements. Um, Curiously, Duchenne's uh, models are often in costumes of varying sorts, and this may be an ex a result of the presence of the camera, but it may also be because, you know, his experiment was not particularly successful in showing such a wide range of emotion. So they needed costumes in order to, to make the point kind of 
more obvious. Next slide. Hugh Welsh Diamond later recounted that for the for this 1852 portrait, his patient had chose to to be to be photographed um, dressed up with a cape and laurels um, for the occasion of being photographed in order to look like a queen and look like someone worthy of being photographed. And so I think we can see the, how the presence of the camera kind of changes events within within the hospital, um, even in a medical context. So in Europe and North America, from the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, photography was used as a strange tool of pseudo-scientific analysis and a means of recording fascinations with um, differences in mental health and particularly its expression in women. Um, next, next slide. But by the mid-20th mid century and moving closer to the moment when Ward 81 was created, it became a tool for documentary work and photographic expose. Despite many hospital administrators' best intentions for providing an asylum or a refuge uh, for patients with mental illness, the lack of understanding about proper treatments, growing populations, and overcrowding all led to unsafe conditions. Albert Maisel's 1946 Life magazine article, Bedlam, most 1946, was a scathing account of conditions in state-funded hospitals, which portrayed them as badly managed and inhumane. Jerry Cook's accompanying photographs argued Maisel's point with grainy black and white images of patients, sometimes nude or in restraints, sitting or lying on the ground, sleeping in quarters filled with beds, or laboring in different settings. Next slide. Featuring a woman with her legs pulled up around her chest and a cavernous pace with paint peeling from the walls, this photograph anticipates Mark's attention to the body language and gestures of the women of Ward 81. However, the faceless woman in Cook's photograph is dwarfed within the room and by extension within the system of mental health care. Mark's, next slide. Mark's approach to patients who often held themselves in similar poses resulted in images that are closer and more immediately in inviting viewers identification with her subjects. Next slide. Between the 1950s and 80s in the US and Europe, Psychiatrists, hospital administrators, and government officials became a process known as deinstitutionalization, which aimed to correct over, overcrowding and underfunding and problematic therapies like UCT with new medications and the closure of large hospitals. And the first antipsychotic drug, chlorpromazine, or otherwise known as Thorazine, um, was introduced in France in the 1850s, in the US in, 18, in um, sorry, 1954. Um, was marketed as a, as a cure for disturbed patients that could that could replace shock therapy and keep patients out of hospitals. And this this story, again, from Life magazine shows a sort of before and after effects of women who are able to leave hospital stays much more much faster because of antipsychotic drugs. Throughout the second half of the 20th century, a number of socially concerned photographers and filmmakers working in different parts of the world undertook studies of the experience of institutionalized mental patients, taking part in what is loosely known as the anti-psychiatry movement. Next slide. Humanario, which is a book by Alicia D'Amico and Sarah Fascio, is closer to Ward 81 um, because it's a long-term collaborative endeavor that investigated four state-run mental hospitals in Buenos Aires. But as a project that took shape over many years and in multiple hospitals, it lacks the immediacy and personal connection that Mark achieved by photographing fewer women in an intense way. Next slide. So in these ways and many more, Ward 81 deviates from its precedence as it was produced between a joint effort between a photographer and a licensed therapist who are both outsiders to the institution they photographed, but who chose to become insiders by immersing themselves in their world. And they approached patients in a way that avoided voyeuristic connotations of documentary photography, but also the sensationalist efforts of 19th century photographer doctors. With that, I will turn it back to you, Gail. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, and now we're gonna dive a little bit uh, deeper into the project itself uh, after this great uh, historical presentation. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the project really started uh, when Marilyn Mark um, was a, an onset photographer for the movie One Fe uh, Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest um, in uh, 1975. And um, while being at the hospital, she took the opportunity to visit the other wards where um, they were not shooting. And uh, thanks to the superintendent at the time, Dr. Brooks, who was also playing his own uh, role in the, in the film. Uh, and after a lot of negotiations, uh, she decided with uh, Karen Folger Jacobs, a, a school friend, and a licensed therapist interested in the questions and the issues surrounding around women and mental health, um, they decided to uh, travel, uh, drive to uh, the hospital, which was located in Salem, Oregon. Uh, at the time, uh, when visiting the hospital, when she was photographing uh, on set, she discovered a, a ward, Ward 81, where uh, the female patients were living. And it was uh, the only locked and secure psychiatric ward for women in the state. So uh, this type of facilities were, uh, were actually quite rare. And uh, so it became very interesting for Marilyn and Karen to uh, decide to go back and explore the project. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so Mary Ellen and Karen uh, lived in uh, the hospital in an adjacent ward, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, for 36 days, photographing and recording uh, the patients. Uh, Caitlin also mentioned the you know, social context at the time and the intellectual framework of the time around mental health institutions. And uh, we are in social context in favor of the anti-CI. Uh, psychiatry movement, uh, which was denouncing the living conditions and the therapies uh, practice on patients in mental health uh, institutions. Um, Marilyn Mark was also interested uh, in individuals living on the fringes of society. And uh, you can see uh, this throughout her, her whole career. Um, she you know, photographed um, homeless youth or prostitutes. So, uh, really um, believing uh, strongly with Karen uh, while they were starting the project that um, in opening doors that are supposed to be closed. So really uh, getting into a place where photography is not supposed to happen. Um, so again, Marilyn, uh, uh, Marilyn's approach and uh, ambition uh, is around uh, sharing time and space and Karen's ambition, obviously. Uh, was about sharing time and space with uh, was one of the most invisible parts of American society. Um, so the project all uh, throughout reveals a strong concern for ordinary people, uh, you know, the famous at uh, the periphery of the American dream. And that's really something that can define uh, Maryland's career um, as a whole. Um, so the problem is, you know, how do you find as a photographer and a, a researcher, how do you find the most ethical and just way to interact with and document a group of very vulnerable institutionalized women? Um, you know, as Caitlin mentioned, the women were committed for inflicting or being likely to inflict harm upon themselves or others, but what yeah, we discover you know, hearing the recordings and, and learning more about the project is that uh, most of the women were also victims of abuse and mistreatment and obviously probably some uh, issues uh, of addiction uh, for some of them. So the project represents for both women, Marilyn Mark and Karen Folger Jacobs, a challenge, a, 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 a exciting, an exciting challenge. Um, but for Marilyn Mark, the photographer, it's really uh, to look at a way for a way to eschew any traditional documentary approach, uh, to avoid taking advantage of the defenseless patients and to avoid sensationalizing the situation. Um, so that becomes a real um, uh, topic of conversation between the two women. And, and you can also read this uh, in, the, in the different writings about the project, whether 
the writings come from Marilyn or Karen or interviews of uh, both of them. Um, so the idea of uh, staying uh, over a month in immersion with the patients was uh, intended to minimize the intrusion, to create a form of intimacy and to avoid subjugation and objectification, uh, you know, things that Caitlin alluded to. Um, next slide, please. So um, one way to create a bond and uh, to start interacting with the patients, uh, Marilyn and Karen brought a Polaroid cameras and audio recorders um, so that the patients could use them either to photograph themselves, record themselves, or photograph other patients, or record other patients. And what uh, happened is that um, um, Marilyn, Mark, and Karen Forger Jacobs started to notice that the woman, as Caitlin had also mentioned about the 19th century photograph that she discussed, that the woman would get ready to be photographed. So uh, there was this uh, interaction that was starting to happen in this process of getting ready with makeup, by like putting specific clothes on, um, you know, fixing their hair, um, that would uh, give this woman a sense of dignity and pride. And that was an important step in the, in the process. Um, so the other, the idea was also for the patients to take ownership of the whole uh, experience. And so they would keep, for example, the photographs at the end of the, of the, session, the session. Um, so really the project aimed at giving a voice and a form of agency to the woman. Uh, Marilyn Mark said in 1978, I didn't want to use them, I wanted them to use me. Uh, so there's like a reversal of the power dynamic that is uh, looked after. Um, so, you know, Caitlin uh, alluded to that, but the photographs reflect an extensive and privileged relationship between the patients and the two, the two women. Uh, it's also true for the audio recordings where we can hear the bonds that uh, exist between uh, Mary and Mark, Karen Volker Jacobs and the patients. Um, so this participant obser observation is the method methodology that was chosen to gain familiarity, to integrate in the environment and to engage uh, with uh, the woman. Um, interestingly, according to uh, Mary Ellen, good, the good photos came at, uh, didn't come until they got uh, to know the woman and, and until the patients uh, got involved in the project. So really the participation of the patient uh, was perceived as crucial to uh, make this project happen. Um, the uh, patients were um, informed and uh, um, had to, were, um, had to sign waivers uh, to participate in the project. If they were not able to sign themselves, their family could be asked to uh, um, sign the waivers. Uh, so it was a voluntary uh, experience. Um, and we do have in the exhibition an example and a copy of uh, one of the waivers. Uh, next slide, please. So this idea of focusing on the uh, woman and the um, uh, giving them an agency and a voice um, um, really is perceptible throughout the collection of photographs that you know, uh, exist in the project. Um, there were close to 350 uh, rolls of film that were used, so there's a lot of photographs. Um, but what's really uh, evident is uh, the way uh, Marilyn is interested in um, um, emphasizing the individualities and the personalities of each of the patients. Uh, so in this case, you have Mona, uh, Caitlin also mentioned this photograph, but Mona is a good example of a woman who interacts with the camera repeatedly. Um, she's very, um, uh, you, she's, I don't know if she's, um, I, I don't know how to characterize it. I wouldn't say she's happy, but she's clearly um, uh, playing with the camera and uh, making something happen in front of the camera. She's creating the moment. So she's uh, participating in the experience of the, um, the, the capture of the photograph. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, another photo also. 
uh, added some of the quotes that you can find in the book, or uh, we also have quotes in the, in the exhibition. Um, so just again, to emphasize how the woman um, had you know, the possibility to express themselves, whether in, photogra in photography or um, by talking and recording themselves. Um, you know, again, the, the, the sitter here, Mary Iris, is very conscious of the, of the moment and what's happening with the uh, photography happening. What's interesting also is how Marilyn tries to integrate into the photographs uh, really how uh, personal histories that are very specific to the woman um, are important. So in this case, we know that Mary Iris, for example, had a, a close family uh, and then they took care of her, they visited her. Um, so this idea of having the framed photograph on the desk is kind of an allusion to uh, this. Next one. Uh, so we have uh, some examples where it's very clear also uh, that the, the patients are um, playing with the camera, performing in front of Mary, sometimes caring. Um, so they're hiding themselves. Um, they're using humor. Uh, next one. Another one hiding half of her face, but clearly looking at the camera. Um, and then this one. So we do have assertive personalities. This example is a good one of uh, uh, Beth and Mona in the shower, where you know you can tell the very different uh, individualities that you have in front of you with the very shy Beth in the back and the very flamboyant Mona. <laughs> Mary Ellen Chen would call her um, at, the, at the forefront. Um, uh, and then just showing you uh, one contact sheet where you see the process and you know the way to approach the, the, the sitter uh, and um, you know, also the editing, the marks on the contact sheets. And we're interested in that type of object. So we included uh, some of these in the in the exhibition also. Next one, thank you. So, you know, because of this uh, emphasis on the woman and the individuality and the idea of giving the, them, uh, empowering them and giving them a voice, um, it's interesting to notice that um, actually Marilyn focuses really uh, almost exclusively on the woman. And, you know, there's uh, very few photographs of the facilities, the buildings, the yard. Um, so it, it's just this idea of um, um, really, again, trying to emphasize the presence of the woman in the space and not have the space uh, overpowering them, um, which is often the case in uh, uh, similar projects where the institution is kind of like over, uh, empowering the, the, the patients. Uh, in this case, uh, you see here and there in, in, in the photographs how, um, you know, the buildings are built and um, how the, where the woman lives. So, you know, you have that type of photographs where you see uh, the doors, the next one, please. Uh, you see the barred windows, uh, the, the beds, um, um, a little bit of the yard where they're allowed to go. Uh, you know, the food tray. So some of uh, these give a little bit of uh, contextual uh, information, um, but they're really not the predominant ones. Um, uh, again, this idea of focusing on the woman. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we also know that the negotiations were difficult with this, the medical staff that uh, who didn't want to be uh, photographed necessarily uh, by fear of being represented in a negative way. Um, so most, you know, of uh, the times we uh, don't have clear photographs of uh, the aides, the nurses, or the doctors. Uh, next one, please. Um, again, in uh, this exhibition and in this project, you have very, very difficult uh, images. Uh, uh, this one, Caitlin talked about it, and um, it, it, it was a challenge uh, for Marilyn Mark and for Karen Walter Jacobs to photograph uh, this moment. 
uh, it was hard to get permission. And once they, you know, got permission, uh, it had to be thought out to decide how to photograph a difficult uh, moment like this one. And obviously in the curation, these are also questions that you ask yourself as for if you can include uh, images like. Um, so again, um, the ideas, um, you know, really try to try for uh, Marilyn Mark was really to try to find a way to humanize the patients to convey their desires and reflect their dignity and resistance to the confinement. There's a lot of photographs of resistance, which I think are uh, also an um, important part of the, of the project. Um, the, again, the ethos uh, was to try to avoid exploiting the woman's uh, difficult situation. Um, so it was really an experiment in a way. Uh, the project was an experiment and um, this idea of trying to find an appropriate framework that would allow for empathy and identification with uh, the woman. And often Marilyn Martin and Karen Volder Jacob said that it could have been any of us as women. Um, so, you know, once um, you, you know, we, Caitlin and I realized that it was really what the project was about, we decided to um, make some decisions related to the exhibition. So how do you reflect that idea of really focusing on the personalities, the woman and their dignity? How do you reflect that in uh, the exhibition? So, please. Next <clears throat> um, so, um, for those of you who uh, don't know our space, we have what we call a, a great hall, which is the, the reception um, hall, and we have that vestibule, uh, that glass uh, vestibule that we often use uh, to, uh, for design, um, to just welcome people uh, in the space. Uh, in this case, we're using it uh, with a, an enlarged vinyl uh, showing one of the photos that I mentioned where you see the, the grid, gridded um, door. Um, next one. Um, so the first room uh, is really uh, dedicated to uh, how to set the tone and explain where the project uh, is originated from. Um, and we, uh, thanks to the Mary and Mark Foundation people, we had access, they created that floor plan um, that allowed uh, us to better understand um, the space. And we thought it was gonna, you know, also probably be helpful for people to see it. And it makes a fantastic graphic element for, um, you know, the introductory wall. Um, so the first room um, is uh, painted in a different color, uh, just to explain, you know, again, how the project originated and on the set of uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So we have uh, different types of uh, photographs. Uh, we have film stills, on-set photographs, regular portraits. Uh, but the interesting part uh, is that in this room, uh, we start to merge uh, the future project with the, 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 the onset uh, um, photograph. Um, so this wall is really about the um, film. Next. And you can see different portraits um, of the actors, uh, you know, actors uh, and roles that became seminal um, and still today, next one, you'll recognize some of them. Uh, we included a, a reproduction of an article in uh, the New York Times with a photograph of Marilyn Mark of uh, Nurse Ratched for those who know the movie. Uh, next one. We included some of the contact sheets And then on this wall, that's where we start to merge um, the uh, photographs from the movie uh, and the, the on-set photographs and the first uh, 
female patients that Marilyn Mark was able to meet while visiting uh, the hospital uh, while shooting for the movie. Next one. So you see here um, photographs of uh, uh, at least, we think, three patients. Um, and then next one. Um, photographs from the set. Um, and you'll recognize here Michael Douglas, who was uh, the producer of the movie. And we know that the woman and the patients in Ward 81 knew about the um, film being shot in the hospital because in one of the photographs in the, in the, you know, the, the project in Ward 81 shows Mona in bed holding a poster of Michael Douglas. So you also have that connection. Next one. Uh, and then uh, the project, uh, the, the following three rooms are uh, really about the project itself. Uh, what we decided was to divide the exhibition um, with uh, individual, you know, series uh, and um, by women. So we divided the, the exhibition in subsections by women where um, we have a bigger contextual image, uh, mostly of, you know, the bedrooms or um, the corridors. Uh, and then we have the smaller images about uh, the woman themselves. So if you go to the next one, we have different um, sections. And then we decided to add the quotes uh, from almost all of the women uh, we added one of the, the quotes uh, one, uh, um, based on the recordings that we had access to. Um, and the quotes are really interesting because they also reveal a lot about their personalities and their uh, consciousness of being uh, institutionalized. And uh, most of them are very aware and very conscious of um, the fact that um, they're, some of them are sick and the conditions that they are living in and the fact that it's not, they're not appropriate and the violence that is being imposed upon them. It's very clear when you read the, the different uh, recordings, the transcripts. Next one. Uh, so the uh, Martin Bell um, made um, a video uh, Martin was Marilyn Mark's uh, husband, and he made a video uh, with some of the uh, recordings. So we hear the voices of the woman, of some of the conversations between the patients with Marilyn and Karen, but also we hear the nurses and the aides. Um, so we do have access to um, other moments that we don't necessarily have access through the photographs. And uh, he made that uh, eight minute video for the exhibition so that the, the really the sound is kind of um, bleeding throughout the space. So the woman have a, actually a voice in the space. Next one. So uh, the reason why we have different numbers of photographs per woman really depends on you know how much uh, Marilyn had access to the woman and could interact with them and was able to photograph them. Um, we um, I mentioned in the introduction that we included some ephemera and some archival material. So you can see here in the case in the middle of the space in the between, uh, we do have the waivers. So we redacted the name. So the woman stay anonymous. This is doc, sorry. This is Dr. Brooks, who was the superintendent, who was the actual superintendent, who also plays his own role in the film. Um, and then uh, because we collaborated with uh, the foundation, we had access to the book mock-up, for example, early editions uh, of uh, the book. 
sorry. Uh, working cards used to make the book with some annota interesting annotations about corresponding with Dr. Brooks about can we make this image public? Can we uh, print it in a book? Response from the doctor trying to negotiate. So the, this um, really in-depth uh, examination of the process was, uh, for us interesting to include in the exhibition. And then this is a recent book uh, made by uh, another uh, photographer who went back to the hospital in 2010 and photographed the empty uh, buildings and facilities. And Marilyn Mark wrote uh, the foreword for the book. So the, the spaces are empty where her book is all about the woman. So it was an, it's a, an interesting contrast with uh, her book. Next. And these are the waivers. That's one waiver. All right. Over to you, Katie, for the rest. Um, so after looking at that case, I want to say you know, what an unbelievable pleasure it's been to work on this show because there's been such a depth of archival material and kind of a range of, of supplemental things that um, have helped us understand this work more fully. Um, and that's really thanks to materials that Mary Ellen saved herself, materials that her staff um, have really um, expertly researched, um, including making that floor plan um, and, and materials that Karen Fulter Jacobs um, has saved up until, up until this time and has generally lent to this exhibition um, that have really helped us understand this material better. Um, so this penultimate gallery shows uh, four different women, um, and unusually, rather, we have one uh, section that's a little bit different, and it's this um, section on the on the left hand side, um, which shows um, two patients, Mona and Beth, together. Mona and Beth um, had some kind of intimate uh, friendship, if not relationship, and appeared in so many images that um, it made sense to kind of give them a section um, where they're together. Um, if you want to see the next slide, but on the right, um, we see what, like photographs of Mona in, in many different states. Um, and I think she constitutes maybe, there's maybe only one other patient uh, who was photographed as much as Mona was, um, which is Mary Iris, who we'll see in a moment. Next slide. Um, on the left, you see the image that Gail mentioned earlier on. Uh, where Ramona is in bed with a headshot of Michael Douglas. Um, and, you know, it's clear from Mary Ellen's photographs and, and other, other images that um, the, the stat, like the, the cast of um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest really, really did interact with patients um, pretty, pretty directly. Next, next slide. There's more of Mona. Next slide. And again. Next. Next. Like I mentioned, um, it was you know a, a challenging editing job. I think for for Mary Ellen and Karen um, in making the, the book and this original edit of this project, and, and also for us because so many of the images were so strong and compelling that um, ultimately you know, we really wanted to. To pick up what, what Mary Ellen had envisioned, which was to show really full representations of, of any individual, um, and rather than, than one single shot that could really dictate how, how you could understand a person. Next slide. And next. 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 Um, there were unusually very few of Mona's, of, of Beth, um, where she's really by herself, and, and, and most of them, she's, she's with Mona. Next. 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 Uh, I think the material in the cases in both of these two last galleries is really important. Um, here we have image, um, letters and cards that women made, Mary Ellen and Karen, um, both while they were there and and afterwards, um, Mary Ellen celebrated her birthday during her stay at Ward 81, and there are birthday cards and letters that really 
give us a sense of, of how impactful their presence was um, in, in Ward 81. It wasn't simply that, that Mary Ellen and Karen were there to record, but they, they really made an impact, I think, on, on the women who were there, um, in part because they, they felt paid attention to, um, and they felt um, like, like Mary Ellen and Karen really tried to get to know them. Um, one, one of the most important, I think, uh, outcomes of this project was that following um, or projects for Board 81, Karen Folger Jacobs went on to serve on the President's uh, Commission on Mental Health for Jimmy, under the Jimmy Carter administration and was able to um, give talks where she recounted specific case histories and life stories um, and the conditions of women living on Ward 81, and later shared the final published book produced in 1978 um, with like, different um, kind of, you know, appointed members of, of U.S. government, including the head of the National Institute for Mental Health at the time. Um, so we have clear examples of how um, the findings of this project really, you know, did make it to the desks of people who might be making policy decisions, um, at least in the U.S. Whether or not they were implemented is harder to say, but I think the bigger projects um, for this was, was to try to raise awareness about the experience of, of people suffering from mental health issues and who are institutionalized, um, which clearly continues to be an issue. Um, but but you know, I think one of the outcomes of this project was successful in that respect. Next slide. And so here we have kind of different archival ephemera showing those points. Next slide. And um, an account that Karen wrote of, of her stay at Ward 81 that was published in um, a magazine about sociology. Next slide. And in this last gallery, we have, um, I think, only three additional women, um, in part because there are so many amazing photographs of Mary Iris, um, who was the patient whose kind of close up of eyes that I showed in my talk. Next slide. Next slide. And as, as Gael mentioned, you know, Mary Iris had a really engaged family. Um, her sister was also institutionalized um, in a different ward at the same hospital and their parents came to visit them. And so they had a kind of different level of family engagement um, than many of the other women um, lived at Ward 81. Um, on the on the far left hand side, uh, we have an image, like a kind of a rare image of an orderly at the at the hospital um, who was kind of tasked with handing out daily medicine for everyone, and like the kind of daily sheet on like on in front of his desk is in a kind of amazing like snapshot of of daily life at at Ward eighty one, with a, you know, everything from the day's dates to different rules to upcoming holidays. Um, it kind of gives gives you a sense of how mundane life could really be there. Next slide. And as Gael mentioned, um, you know, through repeated photographs, Mary Ellen was able to um, show like really kind of habits of gesture and repeated poses on um, lots of different and kind of different aspects of, of any one patient's personality um, through photographing them over and over again. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And on the right here, uh, we see um, Mary Ellen, oh, sorry, um, Karen with Mary Iris, and we have a sense of uh, the amazing kind of level of intimacy that they achieved um, in what both feels like a really long and not that long period of time um, to spend with, with people who you are kind of getting to know through this environment. Next slide. Next slide. Um, this case has kind of the after effects of, of the project. So following uh, Mary Ellen and Karen obviously left Ward 81. Um, they set about um, exhibiting and publishing this work in a book. Um, and in 1978, Mary Ellen had a small exhibition at the Leo, Leo Castelli Gallery in New York. And that kind of garnered some, some public attention and coverage of the project, um, different magazines like Newsweek and Time, which we have here. Next slide. We have a photograph by Tricia Gantz on the bottom of Mary Ellen with her photographs, possibly at the gallery um, or in some other setting. 
uh, but this was a, a, an exciting archival find, um, sort of towards the end of creating our checklist. And above, we have a number of examples of the Polaroids that, that Gael and I both mentioned um, as a result of, of different photo shoots. Uh, and these were really a way for uh, the women to, who were being photographed to have a tangible kind of memento of, of the entire project. And we wanted to show contact sheets mostly as a way to show um, how exacting Mary Ellen was about the shot that she wanted to get. You know, it's not like she's shooting the same scene over and over again. She really um, had a clear vision for the kinds of images that she wanted. Next slide. Some more examples. To see these, to see these like up close, you'll have to visit the show in person. Uh, next slide. Um, and next slide. Last scene. Um, you know, Marilyn had a nice attention to like little mementos and different um, sort of objects that, that that women kind of kept close to them. And on the far left hand side is a sort of it's a, I think it's a cigar box with different kind of trinkets and Polaroids that that were produced um, during this photo shoot. Um, I think as a sort of meta sign of the importance of this project to um, Tommy, to the woman who probably had this, had that box. Next slide. Next. Um, and next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we do have some questions, uh, Caitlin. Um, so, um, well, there's one about uh, why show um, one project instead of a whole retrospective. Um, if you, I can answer, but if you want to answer, Caitlin, you can start. Well, I'll, I think I'll say that there should be a retrospective, Mary Ellen, and I think there will be. Um, and I'm excited to see her work in in a retrospective fashion but what was exciting to us and you could say more about this was the chance to not do something retrospective and to do a deep dive into one project because you know this gives you a chance to flesh out all of these archival details that we just went through um and you know yeah specific. it's a nice way to show all the layers and uh, go into further details on uh, a specific project to have access to more um, also materials, uh, more varied materials, because you have more time on one project, so you can really try to dig deeper into uh, the project. Um, there's also uh, one, one, more thing. one more thing. One, um, you know, this was really one of Mary Ellen's first documentary projects in this way. Uh, and working in in this capacity, so um, I hope that this is a, a reintroduction, but a, an, an introduction to her work in some way. Um, so there's a question about if there was ever a follow up on what happened with the woman of Ward 81. Um, so as we saw with the more contemporary book, the ward is closed. Um, but Martin and Bell, Marilyn's uh, husband, made the video, uh, the short video for the exhibition, but also created a full documentary film um, that we screened at Hot Dog Cinema here in Toronto a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, he and his team were able to meet with three of the women of Ward 81 and discuss with them and film them, show them the photographs and um, the the film is about that interaction and the memories that the woman had of, of the ward. So there was a follow up in that form. Um, maybe I'll, a couple of other questions. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to find a question that we both can answer. Oh, maybe that's a question for you, Caitlin, uh, because I don't know if I could answer actually. 
Um, so first, uh, congratulations to you, Caitlin, apparently an old colleague and friend from Rutgers, uh, <laughs> um, and wanted to ask whether uh, there have been any past exhibitions of documentary photography, photography that have particularly inspired your curatorial approach. Oh my goodness, James. Um. <laughs> it's interesting, uh, but I'm not sure I could answer. I don't know, maybe you have that. I mean, I'm I'm blanking on like specific specific exhibitions, but I think anything that that adds kind of additional context with context sheets or archival documents or um, you know exhibitions that I that I really like. But you know, certainly what what interested us in this project was was the chance to to delve into Mary Ellen's archive. Yeah, it was to mix different types of materials. And show a book that like is really I think historically important, but hasn't been hasn't been seen that widely. Uh, so maybe I'll just um, ask one last question before we say goodbye. Um, do you um, what makes these photographs different? from pictures made by other documentary photographers who visited institutions. Um, I can start, but you alluded to that in your presentation. I think the main difference is the immersion part, not just because of the immersion, but because then it allows for different types of interaction to happen with uh, the patients. And so different types of photography can also happen. Uh, also, access is less regulated when you're part of the proceeding life of the patients. Uh, so you have access to moments that maybe uh, you wouldn't be able to photograph if you're just visiting for two hours. Um, so for me, the immersion part is important in that regard of like really creating different types of uh, uh, relationship. Uh, but also, again, I think um, most of the photographers, at least most of the projects I know, uh, and maybe can, can you correct me if I'm wrong, again, they uh, tend to focus on how the institution is uh, kind of, you know, um, uh, imposing on, on, the, on the patient. So there's a, a lot of uh, kind of gigantic architecture or building, and you're going to see very tiny characters in the middle of the space where we have the exact uh, reverse here, where again, the focus is on the individual. So uh, it's, not, it's not really about the location itself, it's really about the individuals who inhabit uh, the place. That maybe you want to. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think Mary Ellen is playing with um, images that sort of, uh, Kind of conform to stereotypes of psychiatric photography and then really defy it, defy them. And as you were talking, I was thinking that you know we could have edited this show differently, and it would have been an amazing portrait show. You know, you could have um, you know, removed the, like any connotations of, of bars or uh, restraints, and and it would have still seems like a really kind of psych kind of psychologically penetrating. Um, view into into different people's kind of inner worlds. So um, I think that that the attention to the individual is really what differentiates this from from other projects. I think uh, we're gonna stop for tonight. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Caitlin, for joining Ooh. us. Um, and uh, have a great night. And uh, we hope to see you soon in the gallery if you haven't seen the show. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.